The route through the east of Scotland begins in Ballindalloch, leads to the coast to Banff and follows the coast to Balmedy Beach, where it veers inland to Loch Tummel. From there it heads towards the coast again to Dundee and then on to Edinburgh and ends at the attractive and historic Jedburgh Abbey. North of Ballindalloc begins the Whiskey Trail, a trail where there is one distillery after another. The Cardew Distillery is located only five kilometres away from Ballindalloc. The slender chimney rises sharply from the premises. The turret, mounted on the distillery building, gives it a striking appearance. The distillery has a mash tun capacity of 7.2 tonnes and eight fermenting vessels with a total of 296,000 litres. The whisky from this distillery forms an important part of the Johnny Walker brand. Under its own label, Cardew, both a 12-year-old and a 22-year-old single malt is released. This distillery also produces specialities such as the Special Cask Reserve, a rare malt which has only been bottled twice, in 1998 and 2000, and a 27-year-old bottled in the year 1999. There were bottlings in the 70s which are now highly collectible. Among whisky drinkers, the Glen Grant distillery is also famous. This distillery was founded in 1898 by James Grant, opposite another distillery owned by Glen Grant, which were connected via a pipeline. In 1902, it was closed and the pipeline was cut. By 1965, it had been renovated and reopened. Two years later, it was expanded to incorporate four stills. In 1977, it went to the Seagram Company, and finally in 2001 to Piano, but they closed it the following year and parts of the site were sold off. Today it is back in operation and has a mash tun with 4.6 tons of stainless steel and eight fermenting vessels with a capacity of 184,000 litres. It is in the warehouses at Glen Grant where the whisky matures. Since the distillery didn't go into operation again until 2004, the oldest whisky currently available is five years old. The plant can be visited during guided tours. Situated nearby is the Glenfiddich distillery, a popular brand among connoisseurs. The plant is a very modern one, although some of the old structures are still present, but are skillfully combined with the modern facilities. There are also multilingual tour guides, because the rush of visitors from many countries is quite large. When building the distillery in 1892, and for reasons of cost, second-hand stills were bought. In the mid-50s, these were expanded, and the number of stills was increased to four. Two more were added later. Today, the distillery has nine stills, a mash tun, and ten fermenting vessels made of Douglas fir tree wood. Some wags from the distillery have parked in the parking lot a car that, if one comes from the distillery, having perhaps overindulged, it would probably cause confusion. If, on the other hand, it's just a cautionary piece of art or simply a curiosity, it's not sure. But in any case, drunk or sober, the car, which protrudes from the lamppost, would certainly make you think twice. Whiskey is aged in casks, which only survive one or two uses, then the casks must be replaced. The casks used are never new ones, but come from, and after being used, for the production of sherry or bourbon. New casks will result in a flavour which would be too intense for Scotch whisky, a flavour for which the American bourbon whisky is intentional and characteristic. When the casks for producing bourbon are no longer useful, they are exported to Scotland. The same applies to the use of sherry casks from Spain. A short walk from the distillery, you reach Castle Balveni. It was built in the 12th century and expanded in both the 15th and 16th centuries. 
1720, it was abandoned and steadily fell into disuse. Today, it is a ruin and is administered by Historic Scotland. In Keith, there is the famous Strathisla distillery. It is owned by the Shivas brothers, who produce here the well-known brand Shivas Regal. It was founded in 1786 and is the oldest distillery on the River Spey. In 1836, a fire destroyed large parts of the original plant, and in 1949 it was auctioned off to the Shivas brothers. A black and white cat is the symbol of this distillery. In 1993, a cat was found in a container full of bourbon barrels being imported from America. When the container was opened, a black and white cat lurched out. Not surprisingly, after four weeks at sea inside the container, it was malnourished and the bourbon vapours from the barrels had made her quite dizzy. However, after quarantine, the cat was hired by the company as a mouser at Strathisla. A beautiful nature reserve is situated on the Murray Firth, in which the river Spey flows. Because of the whale sightings here, a variety of water birds can be observed. Worth seeing is the old port city of Port Soy. Port Soy is one of the oldest ports on this coast. It was founded in 1550 by Mary Queen of Scots. In 1692, the port was replaced with large stone blocks and a dock and some quays were built. The large stones were placed vertically because it was assumed that they would be more resistant to leaching of the surf. The theory worked because what is now visible from the harbour is everything unchanged from 1692. Around the port are a number of ancient buildings dating back to the period from 1600 to 1700. The place, especially the port, now serves as the setting for historic films and movies about sea pirates. A remarkable mansion can be viewed in Banff, known as Duff House. It was built from 1735 to 1740 and was regarded as the finest of Georgian houses. However, in the design of the house, it suffered such massive misfortune that Mr Duff himself never moved in here. It even went so far as to say that he never saw the house finished. It was occasionally used as a hotel, and later it became part of the Scottish National Gallery.
Kennedy Beach is located on the coast, a coastline which has wide sandy beaches and vegetated dunes. The landscape is often used by walkers to rest and by daring surfers who don't shy away from these cold waters for swimming because it is very cold here. Inland from the coast, Blair Castle is located in the vicinity of Loch Tummel. The castle has its roots in the 13th century and its history goes back 740 years. There were three major development periods, the medieval, the Georgian and the Victorian eras. The oldest part of the castle dates back to the year 1269 and is known as Cummings Tower. In 1530, the tower was given an extension for the construction of a large hall. In 1740, the second duke changed the castle over time to update it into a living castle. He had the small towers torn away and established the Georgian style. Finally, the seventh duke changed it again into the increasingly popular style of the Victorian period, around 1860. The earlier torn away turrets were refitted, a new hall was built and a spacious ballroom added, and the modern innovations of the time were introduced, like bathrooms and gas supply. At the turn of the century, the castle was used as a hospital during wartime, and since 1922, the family has lived in private apartments in the castle. Blair Castle is nestled in a huge garden area of 1,000 hectares and has land holdings of approximately 60,000 hectares. Through the property lead walks where peacocks strut, displaying their feathers for the enthusiastic visitors. Blair Castle was one of the first castles to be made available to the public. It has more visitors annually than all the other castles in Scotland. It offers various tours for families and groups, as well as special theme tours. A scenic idyll, which was esteemed by Queen Victoria, is Loch Tummel. From the point called Queen's View, you have a wonderful view of what is known as the Hole. It's long and narrow, 11 kilometres long and just under a mile wide. The viewpoint was made popular by Queen Victoria during a visit in 1866. Excuse me. However, it is said that the designation of this viewing point did not derive from Queen Victoria, but from Queen Isabel, wife of Robert the Bruce. Anyway, today, hordes of tourists who arrive in busloads enjoy the view over Loch Tummel. Located here is the oldest tree in Europe. 
it is the yew at Fortingall, which is said to be 3,000 years old. Some daring estimates give the tree some 5,000 years. This European yew tree stands in the cemetery in Fortingall. The trunk is now divided, but in the 18th century it had been measured with a circumference of 16 metres. Looking at the tree standing within its stone fence, it's hard to believe that it is 3,000 years old, let alone 5,000. Castle Menzies was originally built in the 16th century and restored by the Menzies. For over 400 years it has been the residence of the Menzies family. It's important historically because Bonnie Prince Charlie, on his way to the Battle of Culloden in 1746, spent the night here. In the course of renovations, an 18th century wing was demolished to make way for a Victorian ballroom. The building is an example of the transition from a fortified castle into a residential palace. In recent times, the castle also recorded another famous guest, the Maharaja Singh of the Punjab, who spent a few days here during his stay in Britain. From Loch Tummel, the route goes back to the coast and on to Dundee. Worth seeing in Dundee is the frigate Unicorn, which was launched in 1824 and served the British Navy for 144 years. The ship has travelled extensively. It was originally used in Europe. Then, in 1805, it saw action in Jamaica. It served in Buenos Aires for the invasion of the Rio de la Plata region, but returned to England in 1808. In 1815, it was taken out of service. Today, this grand old ship can be visited at its mooring in the port of Dundee. Unfortunately, with its rig dismantled, the ship is not in good condition. It urgently needs restoration. But clearly visible are the holes in the hull for the 32 gun sites with which it was originally equipped. The name Unicorn was given the frigate after its figurehead, a white painted wooden unicorn at the front or bow of the vessel. Another famous ship in Dundee, which you shouldn't miss, is the Discovery. This was the expedition ship which took Scott and his team to the Antarctic. This ship was the last wooden ship with three sails built in the British Isles. In March 1901, it sailed from its launching site here to the Antarctic. It was specially designed for such a mission. Important was the emphasis placed on a particular firm outer shell in the form of several superimposed planks made from selected hardwoods which would be strong enough to brave the elements and the dangers of ice and freezing water. On their first research mission from 1901 to 1904, the ship was stuck in the Arctic ice for two years, until it was eventually freed by controlled explosions of the ice and the crew was able to begin their return journey. Due to serious financial problems of the Antarctic expedition, the ship was sold in 1905 to the Hudson Bay Company. It became a transport ship, sailing from London to Hudson Bay in Canada. During World War I, it was used to transport ammunition to Russia, and later, during that period, in 1917, it was used in support of the White Guards during the Russian Revolution. Due to ageing, it increasingly lost its appeal as a charter vessel and was retired in the early 1920s. 
A special attraction in Dundee is the Tay Railway Bridge. It's a more than three kilometre long railway bridge at the mouth of the River Tay. With the construction of the bridge during the years 1871 to 1877 was introduced the iron cast technique. Never before this time had anyone dared to use this iron cast technique for such dimensions. The bridge had to accommodate a height of 30 metres above the high water mark to allow for the passage of the then largest sailing vessels. But the bridge became famous not for its engineering brilliance, but by a terrible disaster. In 1879, a mail train was crossing the bridge during a severe storm when it collapsed. It was the middle of the bridge which collapsed under the weight of the train, and the bridge and the train fell into the water. Seventy people were killed. It later turned out that the designers did not sufficiently take into account the wind forces. It was also learned that cast iron itself is not completely suitable for bridge construction. In 1887, the bridge was completely rebuilt from scratch. A pretty little school and famous university town is that of St Andrews. This university was founded in 1411 and is the oldest university in Scotland. From the mid-16th century, they already had here three colleges, St Salvador, dating from 1450, St Leonard's from 1511, and St Mary's from 1538. The university chapel was completed in 1450, and no matter from which direction you approach St Andrews, you will see the tower of the church protruding over the roofs of the surrounding area. Glorious is the side-mounted arcade. It's designed like an open aisle. In the 19th century, the university made remarkable progress in the development of teaching and research in the arts. It also excelled in the fields of biology and physics. In 1897, it collaborated with the universities of the Academic Centre of Dundee. They were all concerned with furthering the progress in the field of medicine. Worth seeing at the sea cliff is St Andrew's Castle. There had already been a fortress here since 1189 in which the bishops resided and had formed the religious centre before the Protestant Reformation. During this period, it also served as a prison. The most prominent inmate was Archbishop Patrick Graham, who was imprisoned here in 1478 in his own castle in what we today would call house arrest. Near the castle are the ruins of the cathedral. Presumably, there was already a religious community here in 732 BC. According to legend, the five bones of St Andrew were brought here by ship from Patras. The slender tower is the resting place of St Rule's Church, dating from 1144. It can even be climbed by the brave. It's about 30 metres high and looks a bit unsafe. The construction was begun in 1160. It was the largest cathedral ever built in Scotland. The work lasted 150 years and it was inaugurated in 1318, but the building was not under a favourable star. Shortly after the nave was finished, the west end of the cathedral was toppled by a storm in 1270. In 1378, it was again severely damaged by fire during a revolutionary war and had to be rebuilt. Again, in 1409, parts of it were severely damaged by a storm, and in the 16th century, the building was already being used as a stone quarry.
historically significant, is the castle on an island in Loch Leven. Loch Leven Castle was built around 1300 and therefore was probably involved in the Scottish War of Independence, 1296 to 1357. In the late 14th century, it came as a gift to William Douglas and stayed for 300 years in the Douglas possession. Mary, Queen of Scots, was imprisoned here from 1567 to 1568 and had to abdicate before she could flee. In 1675, it was bought by Sir William Bruce, but was never used as a residence. The castle and the outer walls almost cover the whole island. The size of today's island was only calculated in the 19th century because the water defence of the Leven River, the water level, has been significantly reduced. The castle includes a rectangular courtyard surrounded by a wall with a tower at one corner and a round tower on the opposite corner. The buildings are only built on two sides. The tower is 11 by 10 feet in plan and has five floors. The castle can be visited only in summer and is reachable only by ferry. The capital of Scotland, of course, is Edinburgh, Scotland's largest city with 430,000 inhabitants. This historic centre is spread over a hill and so is its skyline, the skyline of Edinburgh. At the highest point of the hill, the dominant feature is Edinburgh Castle, overlooking the city with grandeur. It is best to visit Edinburgh on board a double-decker bus. The tour buses run several routes and you can get on and off at all the main attractions. The St John's Church was built in just two years. The foundation stone was laid in March 1816 and already in March 1818 it was inaugurated. The church was planned in the revived Gothic style which was at the time very modern. Located not far from St John's Church is St Cuthbert's Church. St Cuthbert's was for a long time just a village kirk because Edinburgh at this time only extended as far as the hilltop. The foundation of the church dates back to a legend that St Cuthbert of Melrose Abbey came here and stayed in a cave where the church was later built. Another version says that the church was built under a charter around 1127. The area around the church had already been for 1,000 years a Christian burial place. Only one tombstone from an early period is preserved, that of the Reverend Robert Pont, who died in 1606. Since the cemetery was a very lonely spot, Edinburgh being limited to its historical centre, many bodies were excavated and stolen. 
Surgeons and anatomists were paying good prices for cadavers for research purposes. From the cemetery, you have a beautiful view up to the castle, but also to the tower of St. John's Church, located close by. A wonderful place at the foot of the castle is the grass market. The market lies at the foot of what was the extent of the old city at the top of the hill. Here it was easier for cattle and horse and carts to get to the market without having to climb the hill. For this reason there has been a market here since 1300. It was originally a cattle market where there were stables and butchers who butchered the cattle on site, jointed them and took the meat from here to the meat market. From 1670, the place became more like a traditional marketplace, where goods were unloaded and then carried up by porters to the city center. Today, the place has its charm through the well-preserved building structure and the numerous restaurants and bars that make it a popular meeting place. From here, there is also a good view of Edinburgh Castle, the rock on which it stands is the basalt cone of an extinct volcano. The plateau is located approximately 80 metres above the surrounding buildings. On three sides, the rock falls away almost vertically. Those who don't want to climb up by foot can take a bus from the grass market. Just three stops up to the centre. From the castle there extends the Royal Mile to Holyrood Palace. It's the main axis of the city and shopping promenade in Edinburgh. Here you'll find the most historic buildings of the city. Today's Edinburgh Festival Office, called The Hub, was originally the Highland Tollbooth Church. It was built from 1842 to 1845 in the Gothic Revival style. Because of the union of the Church of Scotland and the United Free Church, the church was closed in 1979. The building, having stood empty for several years, was then used as a meeting room for the Scottish Parliament. After construction of the new Parliament building, it was converted to become the festival headquarters. The lower gates of Edinburgh Castle were added in 1888 as a cosmetic touch. The statues at the side doors of Robert the Bruce and William Wallace were added in 1929. Before the gates, there is the Parade Square, the Esplanade. The middle gate was built in 1571 to 73 to replace a ruined tower. The top part was completed in 1584. The Royal Mile is a shopping paradise and is also specially tailored for the tourist trade. Here you'll find all kinds of souvenirs, from traditional kilts to shorts, printed with the Scottish flag of St Andrew.
From a distance, you can see St. Giles Cathedral. This cathedral is one of the most important sites. The first written mention of a church on this site dates from the year 854. The current building dates from 1120. After a fire in 1385, the church was rebuilt in the Gothic style, but the tower wasn't completed until 1495. In the 16th century, it was the workplace of the reformer John Knox. In 1904, a statue of John Knox was erected. It was created by the sculptor McGillivray. In 1633, St Giles was raised to cathedral status by Charles I, but it had already lost this status five years later. It was not until 1689 that it was once more designated as a cathedral. In the 19th century, it had to be fully restored. The cathedral is dedicated to St Giles, the patron saint of the handicapped and lepers, who in the Middle Ages was a very popular patron saint. The main entrance looks almost overloaded, Numerous representational figurines adorn the gate. The figures are a masterpiece of Scottish masonry. Located on the Royal Mile is the City Chambers of Commerce. The design of the building was by John Adams from the year 1753. Originally, there were planned some meeting rooms, a library and accommodation for a trade exchange. Here, there was the central meeting place where royal edicts were read out and other official pronouncements. The column was first built in 1885 before that, there was a cross embedded in the ground. The Tron Church actually came about because of the bishop's controversy in the 17th century, when St Giles was raised to cathedral status. A new church was approved and in 1636, construction was started. In 1647, it was finished. The original wooden tower was replaced in 1829 after it was destroyed by fire. The building, The People's Story, is a museum that tells the story of the people of Edinburgh and offers a good insight into their lives from different periods in the city. The palace of Holyrood House has always played a central role in the history of Scotland ever since its inception as an Augustinian monastery by King David 900 years ago. James V had it remodelled and added a tower. His daughter, Mary Queen of Scots, took the palace as her residence and it is the scene where the infamous tragedies took place such as the assassination of her secretary, Rizzio, in 1566. Today, the palace is the official residence of Queen Elizabeth II, when in Edinburgh. The palace is only occasionally open, because if the Queen is in residence, it is closed to the public. The palace now houses an essential part of the royal art collection, including paintings and sculptures, which are on display in the palace itself and in the Queen's Gallery. The architect for the new Scottish Parliament was chosen from a design competition held in 1998. The draft of the winning entry from Enrique Miralles from Barcelona was finally implemented. The design for the roof is an inverted vessel. 
Enrique Morales died in July 2000, just months after the project began. The Secretary of State, who had chosen the architect, died the same year. The result was that it sparked off numerous debates and delays, and that pushed up the cost. Finally, the building was finished, three years overdue and ten times higher in cost. It was opened by the Queen in 2004. Whatever else you do, you should at least take a ride on a bus from here, which nicely runs off a scheduled tour. Just outside Edinburgh, and also worth seeing, are two bridges over the Firth of Forth. Eighteen seventy nine saw the beginning of the famous Forth Railway Bridge. Plans for this by the engineer Sir Thomas Bush were stopped after his early bridge over the Tay had collapsed earlier that year with the loss of seventy lives. In parallel to this railway bridge, the road bridge crosses the river. Influenced by the failure of the Tay Bridge, the engineers John Fowler and Benjamin Baker were instructed to design a much stronger and more stable bridge, which by its appearance and in its construction would return confidence to future passengers. The result would be a completely new design in the form of a cantilever bridge that could handle larger loads. After seven years of construction, the bridge was officially opened in 1890. It is 2.5 kilometres long and consists of three massive, each 110 metres high, diamond-shaped trusses. The train runs at 50 metres above the water so that ship navigation may continue to pass under. The span between the pillars is 521 metres. The entire construction consists of 54,000 tonnes of steel and is held together by 6.5 million rivets. At the time of its opening, this bridge was the largest in the world. The magnitude of this unique design proved itself over the years as an excellent choice. It is still regarded as one of the most stable bridges in the world and served as an inspiration for Gustave Eiffel, who built the Eiffel Tower in Paris. The parallel road bridge is a highway bridge which was built from 1958 to 1964 and was the largest of its kind then, consisting of nearly 47,000 tons of steel. It was opened to traffic in 1964. Before the opening of the bridge, ferries operated the crossing with a traffic capacity of 600,000 cars, 200,000 trucks and one and a half million people per year. Those who wanted to avoid using the ferry had a long detour to take into account. Since April 2001, the bridge is now a listed building. The Royal Yacht Britannia is situated outside Edinburgh. She was the 83rd Royal Yacht since the one used by King Charles II in 1660. It was built at John Brown shipyard in Glasgow. After her launch in 1953 and her baptism by Elizabeth II in 1954, she went into service. The yacht was designed so that it could be rebuilt in the event of war to act as a hospital ship. 
During her service, she has carried the Queen and her family abroad to 696 destinations and to 272 visits around the UK. Prince Charles and Princess Diana spent their honeymoon in 1981 on board the Britannia. On board this yacht, over 1,000 refugees were evacuated in 1986 from Aden during the Yemeni civil war. Also, the yacht was constructed as a safe haven in the event of nuclear war. In 1997, in their election manifesto, the Conservative Party under John Major promoted the exchange of the Britannia for a modern vessel. After the election victory of the Labour Party, however, in 1997, Britannia was decommissioned and not replaced by a new one. The main reason for this decision was its running costs of 30 million euros a year, which came out of the British taxpayers' contributions. The last official mission for the Britannia was to bring together Chris Patton, the last British governor of Hong Kong, and Prince Charles after the handover of the colony back to China. The Britannia was put out of service in December 1997. Queen Elizabeth II took part at the ceremony, together with most of the older members of the royal family. The otherwise rather reserved monarch was seen to publicly shed a tear when she came off board for the last time. The Britannia is now a museum and is complemented by an exhibition on the history and construction of the vessel. The yacht can also be rented now for conferences and banquets, so it's still earning its keep. In 2006, the Swiss Hollywood star Ursula Andress, the first Bond girl, celebrated her 70th birthday on the Britannia. Also worth seeing is the Seabird Centre in North Berwick. From this centre, which has an exhibition, one can observe, with remote-controlled cameras, the birds on the island of Bass Rock. The rock looks pure white, lit by the millions of northern gannets and puffins that live in a colony on the rock. The island is a conservation area and should not be entered. South of Berwick are a number of monasteries, including Melrose Abbey. This monastery was built by Cistercian monks in 1136 at the request of the Scottish King David I. The East End was completed in 1146. Additional other buildings of the complex took place within the next 50 years. The abbey was built in the form of a St. John's cross. 
The building is now only preserved as a ruin, except the entrance building, which dates from 1590. Alexander II of Scotland and other Scottish kings are buried here. The embalmed heart of Robert the Bruce is supposedly buried in the monastery grounds after it was returned from the Crusades. The Abbey is now handled and administered by Historic Scotland, which is campaigning for the preservation of old buildings in Scotland. The Abbey is known for its many carved stones, showing saints, dragons, gargoyles and plants. Already in the 6th century there was an old Abbey here, about two miles from the convent, which was destroyed by Kenneth I of Scotland in 839. King David I wanted the new abbey built in the same place, but the monks argued that there was no suitable land for agriculture and chose the present location. Slowly, a small town grew up around the abbey. In 1322, the city and large parts of the abbey were destroyed. In 1385, the monastery was burned down. During a period of 100 years, the abbey was rebuilt. However, the building was not finished when, in 1504, James IV arrived for a visit. In 1544, the abbey was again severely damaged by troops and was never again fully restored. This led to its decline as an inhabited monastery. The last monk of Melrose died in 1590. There are other monastic ruins at Dryborough Abbey and Jedborough Abbey, situated a few miles south of Melrose. Dryborough was founded in 1150 by the pre-Monstratensians. Anic monks built the monastery on the land that belonged to Hugh de Morville, the father of one of the murderers of St Thomas a Becket. In 1322, it was burned by English troops then built up again and supported by Robert the Bruce. In 1385 it was again burnt down, but flourished in the 15th century once more. It was finally destroyed in 1544, so today there are only the ruins to be visited.
Jedra is an Augustinian abbey, founded in 1138. The monks probably came from the monastery of St. Quentin in France. Numerous destructions and the Protestant Reformation in 1560 led ultimately to the downfall of the abbey. The east of Scotland is rich in cultural buildings. Monasteries, castles and fortresses can be visited, which allow visitors to immerse themselves in the beauty of Scotland and its chequered history.